Good morning, Southwest Hills. Continuing our sermon series in Colossians, chapter 1, we're in verse 15 through 23 this morning, a glorious passage we're looking at. And as I read the passage, um, I would ask that you pay close attention to the pronouns. In the first five verses, you're going to see he, him, himself, and then in the last part, it's going to shift to you. And so pay close attention to that, and I'd ask that you would stand as I read God's word, knowing it's this morning God's word to us. It's the better part of the sermon. Would you give all of your attention to the reading of God's word? Speaking of the beloved son um, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, Paul goes on. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Would you pray with me? Father, grant us ears to hear this morning what your Holy Spirit would say to us through this your word, and may it be for your glory and for our joy in Christ Jesus. Amen. Maybe seated. A few years back, I don't know how many, 15 or so, I had, uh, I saw a fascinating documentary uh, uh, called Free Solo. Some of you seen that? It's one of the scariest things I've ever seen. It's about a young man named Alex Hanold, and he decided to do the craziest thing you'll ever hear. He decided that he wanted to free climb El Capitan in Yosemite. Now, I've got a slide of that structure. Yeah. (laughs) Those trees at the bottom, those are actually quite tall trees, but they look like bushes. It it is a 3,600-foot monolith wall that juts out of the earth. And a few years back, I did go to Yosemite. I don't remember how many back, but a while back. And I remember seeing people climb this wall. Now, they were doing it with ropes and support system. But they look like ants on the wall. I was just like, who would do that? And then this guy decides he wants to do it free solo. He's going to do it with no support. I I have to confess, even sometimes I was watching and I would be kind of (laughs) like, one misstep and his life is over. Well, spoiler alert, he makes it. He gets to the top, and I breathe a sigh of relief, and he is, they celebrate, they're stoked, they're pumped, they're testosterone racing, adrenaline flowing, celebration on top of this rock. But what struck me was what happened next, because after they had kind of done their little festivities on top of the rock, that evening he goes back to his van that's outfitted for kind of training, pull-ups, and all this stuff, and he starts working out for whatever comes next, something greater and even more dangerous and more glorious. Think about that. Even climbing what appears to be completely unclimbable and and doing so with no support, doing something no human being has ever done before, did not satisfy this guy. He's compelled to go out and look for bigger, a bigger challenge, something greater, something more challenging. And if he finds it, he will discover after completion that that will not satisfy him either. I share that because we're all a lot like Alex. 
We're all looking for what will finally fully satisfy us. Staying that in a negative way, Mick Jagger once said it this way. I can't get no satisfaction. Though I try and I try and I try. And I'm so tempted to sing it, but I'm not Severin. I can't get no satisfaction. We're all a lot like Mick Jagger as well. And there, there's a reason why we're made for more than this world can offer. Blaise Pascal said it this way. There's, there's this, we all have this huge God-shaped vacuum in each one of us, in each of our hearts, that's made for God, that only God can fill nothing in this created order. So in our text this morning, Paul is going to lay out why that is so by showing us first the, the astounding supremacy of Christ as the only one who can actually fill us up to the brim now and forever. So let's turn to the text this morning. The outline is before you. First point, Christ is supreme over the first creation, the original creation. Then second point, Christ is supreme over the new creation. And then the last point, we drive it home. We say, what does that have to do with us? Because Christ is supreme. He is enough for you. So Christ is supreme over the first creation. We're looking at these first couple of verses, 15 to 17. But let me just note this. There's a pattern here. With the first creation and with the new creation, we'll define that in a little bit. He's going to show us how great Christ is because of who he is, then because of what he's done, and then what he continues to do. So first, Christ is supreme because of who he is. Look at verse 15 with me. He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So two things here. He's the, First of all, the image of the unseen God. You, you can't see God in this age. It's an age of faith where you can't see him. But if you want to know what he looks like, or really what I should say, what he is like, you just need to look at Jesus. Jesus, you should still be astounded at this. God took on flesh. You know, all the myths that happened beforehand that happened, I think they were all anticipatory of this reality that God took on flesh in the person of Jesus. He reveals in the flesh what God is like. And in so doing, he's also, there's a subtle hint here that he's also the perfect Adam. Because Adam was supposed to image forth God. But of course, in his sin, he failed. And where he failed, Christ did not. Christ came. He was the perfect Adam. He was the perfect man. What man should look like. And he's perfect God. He's the only one who is those, both of those things. And as such, he alone is supreme over the entire created order. Because he alone is the revelation of God. He alone is the perfect Adam who completed uh, what we were supposed to do in reflecting God. Second, it says he's supreme because he's the firstborn over all of creation. Now, we're going to be tempted to think here, firstborn, like in order chronologically, but that's really not the biblical notion of firstborn. The biblical notion of firstborn is that of privilege and preeminence. As the firstborn, you see it throughout Scripture, the firstborn has all the privileges of the inheritance. That's the idea. Christ, as the firstborn, he has all the privilege rights. He's going to inherit it all. He's going to inherit the nations. That's what he's doing now through the gospel. But it's much bigger. We'll see when he comes back, he's inheriting everything. He's inheriting the whole cosmos, the whole universe. And so he is preeminent. Preeminent means he, he's, he's over everything. He's top ranked. He's over absolutely everything because he has all of the inheritance rights. It all belongs to him. So he's supreme. So here in this first point, we see he's supreme because he reveals God. He's the perfect Adam. And he is the preeminent son who has all of the inheritance rights. Secondly, we see he's supreme because of what he has done in creation. Look at verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Absolutely everything was created by Christ and for Christ. 
Let's deal with each of those. First, the by Christ. Christ was the agent. He was the instrument within the Trinity through whom everything was created. If you look in Genesis, it says that God spoke the word. He spoke it into being, and then John ties it together when John says he is the Logos, he is the word of God, and as such, he was the agent through which the whole created order came into being, all that's visible and invisible. Let's think about the visible just for a second. It means that Christ was the agent through, which, through whom was created every atom. That was God's idea. As well as every galaxy, from the smallest of atoms to the largest of galaxies, Christ is the one who made them. Now, let's just hone in for a second on our galaxy. In our little neighborhood here called the Milky Way, we live in an average-sized neighborhood in the universe. It's, it's, it's about 150,000 light years across. The key word here is light years when you understand what that means. See, light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. Get an idea how fast that is. Light can go around the earth about seven times in one second. You would have to travel that speed for 150,000 years to just get from one edge of our galaxy to the other. And if you ever pretended you wanted to visit a neighboring galaxy, the closest one's 160,000 light years away. So let's say you, would, you had a spaceship that could go, and, could go the speed of light. It would still take you 160,000 years just to get to the nearest galaxy. That's just our little neighborhood. If we can pull up a slide here, this is one of the recent James Webb photographs deep into the universe that aimed it sort of at a dark spot where you'd think, what's, what's in the dark spot? And then when you reveal it, this is it. Those are galaxies. Those are all galaxies in one little dark corner of our universe. The red ones are further away. That's absolutely astounding. You know, how long would it take to travel from this edge of the screen to that edge? Infinity, as far as we know. And it's just one little corner of the universe. And Scripture says Christ created them all. It even says in the Old Testament that he knows all the stars by name. In his infinite knowledge, he created them all. And what's astounding here is that's not all that he made. This, the physical is not all that he made. In fact, in this text, what's emphasized is the invisible, what we can't see. This is what we can see. But he says all the authorities and principalities and powers and rulers, he's speaking of an invisible realm there that we can't see. It's almost as if there's a hint here that the invisible may be bigger than the visible. And all was made by Christ. Even those who are in rebellion, the beings that are in rebellion to him, they're made by Christ. And he's not just the efficient cause of everything. He's actually also the final cause. That is, it's not just by him, it's also for him. Paul says everything was created that was made was made for him. It's made for his purposes. It's made for his ends. It's made for his glory. It's all for him. So Christ is supreme. He is supreme because of what he has done. He is the Logos who created this entire universe, both seen and unseen. It was all by him. It's all for him. But that's not all. He's also supreme because of what he continues to do. Look at verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In him all things cohere. All things are sustained. It's not just a, a universe that was created by a blind watchmaker. That's kind of this deistic idea that came from the Enlightenment that, you know, the universe, God, like a blind watchmaker, made the watch. He put the laws of nature into play, and he just kind of wound it up and let it go, and it's just running according to the laws of nature. That's not a biblical idea. God personally made the universe, and he personally governs his world. And I, I, one example, gravity. Gravity is something that um, scientists really don't know what it is. They can't really define what it is, but they know its effect. They know it works so that there's some object that's so massive, it creates what's called gravity that holds things coming towards it. It brings things in. 
But that's not what it is. That's just what it does. And someone asked G.K. Chesterton once, what is gravity? He had the best response. He says, gravity is just the overflowing power of God that holds the universe together. Isn't that great? That's a Christian view. So apart from Christ sustaining, upholding work, electrons would no longer circle nuclei. Planets wouldn't circle suns. And certainly your life would have no coherence. Your life would fly apart as it's prone to do if it's like mine. No, Christ holds it all together as the massive center of the cosmos. So, Christ is supreme over this first created order, the creation, because of who he is. He's God in the flesh. He reveals God. He's, he's the perfect Adam. He's, he is supreme because of what he's done. He has created the whole universe, visible and invisible. It's all by him and for him. And he is supreme because of what he continues to do. He sustains the entire cosmos. He's the sustainer of life. And then verse 18 pivots the text from the old created order to the new created order. And we're going to see parallels here. Uh, he's supreme once again, and the new created order we'll see is the church created by Christ. He's supreme because of who he is, again, and he's supreme because of what he's done and what he's doing. First of all, because of who he is. Look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So head and beginning are similar concepts. I'll, I'll, I'll treat them together here. But once again, just as Jesus is the author of all life and the physical creation, he is the fountainhead from which flows all life in the created order, so in the church. Jesus is the head of the church. That is, he is the source of her life. He's the founder. And we'll see in a second how he brings life. But he alone has brought life out of death in creating a new order called the church. And it says... Uh, that he was the firstborn of creation, and it also says here he's the firstborn over the new creation. Now, very literally, he was the firstborn from the dead in this new created order. Jesus was the first to be resurrected, and the implication of that, of course, also is that he's not only the first, he is raising up a harvest of souls who will also be resurrected up one day just as he was. But again, the, the emphasis here is not primarily on chronology. Paul here wants to emphasize, again, this means Jesus is preeminent. This means Jesus is, is he's supreme because his victory over death and bringing us life, it makes him supreme over the new creation that comes to life only through Christ and his resurrection power. And then, again, he's supreme in the new creation because of what he's done and because of what he's doing. I'll put these together. Look at verses 19 and 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, in our English translation here, there's a lot of different prepositions. But in the Greek, there's just two prepositions that run through this part, and it's the by or through, and it's to or for. So the idea here is God was pleased by Christ to reconcile all things to Christ. So let's divide it up again here. Let's look at the through or the by, and then we'll look at the four clauses. First of all, through. Just as we were created through Christ, Everything was created through Christ. So now all things are being recreated or reconciled through Christ. Now, I'm going to have to define that in just a second. Hang with me. Uh, in this new creation through Christ, first of all, we mentioned we're told the means through which it happens, right? Specifically, the reconciliation comes through the blood of Christ that's making peace. It's making shalom. It's returning us back to well-being and that shalom that God created us for. But here's the complicated part. Notice the scope of this. It says all things on earth and in heaven. 
The problem with this is it sounds very much like, on the surface, universal salvation. And in fact, this is a key text that people who believe in universal salvation will point to. Oh, see there, he's reconciling all things in heaven and on earth. Well, the problem is that it doesn't concord with the rest of teaching of Scripture, that there is not a teaching in Scripture of universal salvation. And when we understand Paul's language here, the theologians are in agreement that what he's really speaking of here is not cosmic redemption. He is speaking of cosmic restoration. Christ is in the process of renewing, of restoring, much more than just people. You see, at the fall with Adam and Eve, when creation fell through sin, uh, it wasn't just humanity that was affected. It wasn't just you and I that became sinful and dying and corrupt and all of those things. It went into the whole created order, according to Romans 8. According to Romans 8, the fall of mankind was cosmic. It affected the whole cosmos. And we see that, don't we? We see that. You see it because even science sees it because they've labeled the second law of thermodynamics, that everything tends towards disorder and not order. You've seen that in your life, haven't you? Kind of Murphy's Law. And it's because we live in a fallen world. But it's much deeper than that. Death now permeates the cosmos. It's not just people that die. Pets die. Animals die. Plants die. You know, even stars die. But Christ, through his blood, came to reverse the fall. He came to conquer his enemies. He came to set in motion a new age that will culminate one day. And here's what he's doing. He is now setting free, like from this bondage, Romans 8 speaks about that one day, the whole cosmos, the whole universe is going to be set free from its bondage to the glorious freedom of the children of God when Christ comes back. And he started that whole process at the cross by defeating his enemies through his blood so that one day there will be no more weeds no more tears. There'll be no more death. And it's all by Christ and his blood. And this cosmic restoration of all things, it's not just through Christ. It's also for Christ. That's what it says. The text says he's reconciling everything to Christ. In other words, Christ is actively, rightly reclaiming all that belongs to himself. And the blood of the cross is his means of doing that. The blood of the cross is his means of conquering his enemies and restoring shalom to this broken world. Abraham Kuyper expressed this idea really well, well when he said, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of human, our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over, over all, does not cry, mine. It's all by him and his blood, and it's all for him and his glory. There's then a dramatic turn in the text. Paul has ascended the heights of who Christ is and what Christ has done, and then he turns and he says, and you. It's as if he's saying, all of this cosmic power, here's how it relates to you. Here how, is how I have used all of my supreme power for you. So our last point, because Christ is supreme, he is enough for you. Paul's going to take this Christological passage and he's going to bring it down to us. He's going to apply it to our lives. What does that mean for you that Christ is supreme over all? And he's going to draw out three points. We're going to see why we can't get no satisfaction on our own. What indeed can satisfy us? And how do we lay hold of what will satisfy us now and forever. So while we can't get no satisfaction on our own, look at verse 21. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, that's who we are by nature. Paul says we're hostile. We're, he says we're alienated and estranged. Let's start with that. What are we alienated and estranged from? Well, Paul says clearly in 
Ephesians 4.18, that we're estranged from the life of God. We have become estranged from the life of God. And that's what we want. We've been saying that, though. This is what we want. This is what we seek. We all want life. We want life full and overflowing and satisfying. But alas, our sin prevents that because it alienates us from God, who is life, so that we can't find the life that we long for and look for. But we like to think that if we can just have the right mindset on life, if we can just get the right mindset, most certainly we can do anything. That's what the movies, I'm so tired of hearing it in the movies. If you just have the right mindset and you just think right, you can do anything. No, you can't. You can't. There's a, there's, a, there's a problem. You can't even do the most basic thing in, in life. We can't because our minds, which are made by God and are made for God, it says here they're actually hostile in their natural state to God. We're hostile to that reaction. We're allergic to, the, to, the, to having a God over us. Since the fall, we've all wanted to be gods ourselves. We wanted to be rulers over our life. And so we're hostile to God, even if he's the most loving God, we have a natural hostility towards him. We don't bow the knee naturally to him as creator. And it says here, they're, what's more, it's not just this uh, hostility and alienation. Their, their deeds show it forth. And if you're honest, you know that's true. That, that, that our deeds do show forth our hostility, that we are, we're naturally very selfish, I'm amazed at how much when I really take a hard look at myself, how self-centered I can be, how selfish I can be in my deeds. It's all about me. And your conscience rebukes you. If it's functioning right from God, God's given you a gift of a conscience that rebukes you. So this is why the human heart can never find the satisfaction that it seeks in the created order. First, because it's made for the creator himself not for the creation. And second, because it's sinful, it just doesn't naturally line up to its true north, who is God. And no matter how hard you try, you can't make it line up. doesn't matter if you can free climb the Capitan backwards with your eyes closed. It will not satisfy your human heart. It won't give you life. What then can satisfy the insatiable but sinful human heart? Look at verse 22. Christ has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Reconciled is the opposite of alienated. We're naturally alienated, but now to be reconciled means we've been restored to God. We've been restored to the possibility of having that life full and free that we long for in God. Because now, you're freed up through Christ and his blood to have fellowship with God, to have communion with him who is life because Jesus gave his blood, he gave his body as an offering to pay for your sins that alienated you from God and life. So you're made by God, you're made for God. This is the most basic reality possible. And Jesus' death on the cross restores you to communion with your God. But it gets even better. The supremacy of Christ in the created order and in the church, it always has a final goal. It's for something. And here we see one of the most sublime purposes of God in redeeming us, in reconciling us to himself. It says that it is in order to present you holy, blameless, and irreproachable before God one day. Now, there is a beautiful alliteration here in the Greek that it's hard to capture. All these words in Greek begin with ah, ah, ah. It really is beautiful. So I'm going to give you my best dynamic equivalent in English. Best dynamic equivalent would be that you've been... You have been reconciled to God in order that you might be free of sin, free of stain, and free of blame. My friend, that's really what you long for in the depths of your heart, I believe. I believe everybody longs to be free of blame. Everybody, nobody can live a life that's not justified. 
everybody's always about justifying their life. Everybody must do that, or, or you would basically commit suicide if you have no justification. So we're really looking to justify our lives. And here it says it, it's going to be so thorough. He goes on and on, you're, not, you're going to be free of sin that naturally condemns you. You're going to be free of all stain of sin. There'll be no more. And free of all blame before God when you stand before him. That, that's what you're made for. That's what you're seeking. That's what you long for in all of your efforts to find life. You're made by God, you're made for God, and one day you will stand before that God who made you, and you will be, if you were in Christ, the final end of his reconciliation is that you would be free of sin, you would be free of all stain, you would be free of all blame, so that you can do that very thing you're made to do. It's going to be awesome. You're going to have unhindered, nothing will be in the way, you will have unhindered fellowship by sight with the living God, and it will be like drinking from a gushing fountain all the life that can fill our God-shaped voids. Final question, how do you lay hold of that which satisfies now and eternally? Look at verse 23. If indeed you continue in, in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So it, it's faith. It is your faith that lays hold of Christ, and if it lays hold of Christ, it lays hold of life itself. And then Paul uses a metaphor to help us understand here what faith looks like in reality. He, he compares it to a well-made building. Our faith is to be firmly grounded, and it's to be established like a well-made foundation for a building. How does one do that? Well, by holding fast. By holding fast to the only hope of the gospel whenever the building of your life is assailed by false hopes. Hopes based on the supremacy of something other than Christ to satisfy. And the good news here is that you're not on your own. It's not a self-help effort. This is exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. The Holy Spirit is revealing to your heart, if you are listening, he's revealing to yourself your false hopes. Hopes based many times on good things in the created order that we have elevated to ultimate things that we have to have in order to be content he is leading you to see those time and again and leading you to repent and to turn back to the total sufficiency of Christ to fill up your heart. And he does so like a good surgeon, the Holy Spirit does, who removes the cancer of false hopes not founded on Christ. And when he does that, when he begins to surgically remove those false hopes that aren't founded on Christ, you're going to be left with a question. Is Christ enough? Or do I need Christ plus something else in order to be satisfied? When you lose your job, when you lose your job security, you're going to be tempted to lose hope. And you're going to be confronted with this question, is Christ enough? Is he enough for you to be contented? When you lose a loved one, and I know there are those of you right now who have recently lost loved ones. When you lose financial security. When you lose your reputation. When you lose your kids. You don't really lose them, but they go away to college and leave you with an empty nest. When someone that you love deeply fails you. When you lose, or when your country appears to be coming apart. When whatever expectation you had for this life does not come to pass as you had hoped, you're confronted with the question, is Christ enough? The resounding response of Paul is, yes, Christ is enough. 
Because he alone is supreme over all. He's supreme over all of the creation. He's supreme over his new creation, the church. And if you are in him, he's supreme over your life. He is supreme over your salvation. He is supreme over your destiny, your eternity. So here's the message this morning. Here's the application. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hold fast. Immovable to the secure hope of all that God is for you in his beloved son, Jesus Christ. He is supreme over all. And as such, he is all sufficient. He is able to fill that God-shaped vacuum in you. Christ is enough for you. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do his work in and through your word this morning and that we would go away glorifying Jesus this morning. I pray that he would be esteemed as supreme in this church, that this church would exalt Jesus as its treasure and that you would help us to turn from any false hopes that we've been playing with, that we might place all of our hope in Christ alone. We're prone to wonder in our hopes. Holy Spirit, convict us and make us firm in our hope, like a firm building well built. I pray that would be true of this church, and it would be true of our lives because of who you are, the author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.